welcome to the Posit Podcast. I'm Dr. Sam, and with me, you're back, Dr. Robert. <laughs> Thanks. I was going to see you. I've missed you as well. So oh, appreciate the man. homecoming. I said I when Paul and I were were doing he was pinch hitting for you, and I was like, he's off gallivanting. I'll let him tell his story of where he was. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, I love that I use. Uh, Pinch hitting from uh, Paul. I guarantee that's from a that's a that's a Paul joke there from all sports he does. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, back from Iceland, I am excited to be here. But it was an awesome vacation. Uh, and a I much needed, much thought. deserved vacation. I will add. Thank you. I, I, that, it's been means a lot. Uh, and fortunately, I have an awesome team that was able to hold down the fort while we were gone. Because uh, yeah, I realized how much of a vacation I needed. So it was really nice. If anyone hasn't been, truly beautiful country. Uh, can't say enough about it i would go back in a heartbeat um i could live there honestly there's yeah. no one there it's just you could have like acres to yourself and the only thing you're gonna see is sheep which is great so <laughs> um so if you want some loan time go to iceland it's perfect and the, the country's just beautiful as all well. yeah oh yeah i definitely want to go i think that's uh awesome i'm so glad that you guys got to go and just thanks get the time that you deserved um but we did miss yes. you and it's just never quite the same without you here. <laughs> and I did tell Paul, he was he was sort of like, you know, one of these days I actually have to do a podcast with Robert. I was like, I think Robert <laughs> feels the same way. Like, I feel like he feels yes. like, you know, he'll you, you only do it when he's not there. And that, you know. So. I feel like the content of the podcast will change very quickly, though. Him and I'll be like, well, how about the Detroit Tigers right now? <laughs> and yeah, we'll I feel like it'll be like a program. crossover podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Where where does vet med and sports meet? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure I can find a way. I can make it work. Uh, I so could. I think you could. Maybe we'll do one on mascots of like uh, the different teams oh. or something like that. We could do. A you know, that's actually crossover. that might be the way to do it. <laughs> I mean, like Ugo, we could talk about him the entire time because he's uh, you know a bulldog. So exactly. I actually we'll actually make this work. Tell Paul we'll schedule something. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Um, but I thought um maybe today since um you're back and we get to have a chat um, that we would talk about something that um, is a, a really important topic. So um, a lot of people rescue um, and a lot of people talk about rescuing or even get when you get a puppy or a kitten, um, you know, what happens if it doesn't work out? And so we want to talk a little bit about rehoming um, because it's a really, really hard topic to talk about. And I think sometimes people can get like really hefty opinions about it. Um, mm -hmm. and so I think, I think as with anything, you know, we're just going to share sort of our experience and, and our opinions and they're just ours, but, um, but I do think it's a really important topic because it is something that we come up against and, and usually these things are sort of, um, inspired by cases that I have. And I did have one recently where, um, a wonderful owner, a really, really dedicated, great, wonderful owner had a dog um, that he was super bonded to, just this awesome shepherd that passed away um, mm -hmm. because of inflammatory mammary cam cancer, just like way too early. Mm -hmm. um, and she was just his companion. She was with him every day. She went to work with him. She was part of his life every day. Um, and, you know, in, I think he, so so in his sadness and everybody around him mm -hmm. was just really, really trying to get him to, to find his next companion. Um, yeah. He was sort of, I don't want to say pushed, but, you know, just sort of convinced that there was this dog that, you know, was just going to fit right into his old dog's shoes. And he, he adopted her. And unfortunately, she's just not like that other dog. Um, same yeah. breed, but um, even looks kind of like her, but um, totally different personality. Not one that could go to work with her safely, not one, uh, with him safely. Um, mm -hmm. One that's already bitten people, um, been aggressive to literally everybody in his life except for him. And, um, so we came in, you know, uh, wanting to just, oh, and PS, she actually also had a memory tumor, um, oh, no, that, really? that they didn't. Yeah. And he had even shared that like with them saying that, like, you know, my dog died of a memory tumor. Like I really like make sure she's healthy basically. And, uh, and he came in and was like, wanted to talk about behavior and this lump on her, on her memory, uh, chain. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And so, you know, he knows the the drill already. Like, I have to remove it to be able to even really truly tell so him it what is. it is and what the implications are and all that. Um, but we did. We had a really, really difficult conversation about whether or not he has to, should um, keep this dog. And 
I think that a lot of people are like, oh, well, if you rescue a dog, I mean, that's it. You've made, you've, you've made a commitment and you have to keep this dog no matter what. And um, while I think you should take these commitments extremely seriously, and I think that you should never adopt a dog thinking, oh, well, or cat thinking, oh, I'll just get rid of it if it doesn't work out. That, that of course is not what I'm saying, but there are circumstances and there are times where it is just not a fit. And I think that, you know, you can end up resenting the dog or the cat because of things that just really are not compatible with your life. And I don't think that that's good for that animal either. And, um, you know, I certainly feel bad for these animals that get bounced around when they are really like a really, really hard case. And mm. I think I do sort of blame the rescue a little bit because they kind of painted a picture of this dog that was not accurate. And I have myself experienced that when I was looking for a dog before we got Gus, you know, mm -hmm. I definitely um, went and met a few dogs and like the description that they gave me and the things that they told me before I met the dog, I was like, I mean, that's not, that's not really true what you're telling me. Yeah. And I was able to recognize certain things because I'm a veterinarian. Like one dog had elbow dysplasia and was painful. And they were like, Oh no, he's not painful. He doesn't limp. And, and I was like, was he on any medication? She's like, yeah, he gets something. I'm like, well, what's it called? She's like, I don't know. And she like showed me the bottle. It's carprofen. I'm like, yeah, he's on NSAIDs every day because he can barely walk. Like he, I, I know this is going to be an issue and I have little yeah. kids and I don't, you know what I mean? So, um, it's just like, and they know what it is. It's not like they don't know. I mean, the foster mom didn't know, but like the, the rescue yeah. knows, you know what I mean? So not to demonize yeah. rescues, but anyway, getting back to the, the story, but like, you know, we had a really, really long, hard conversation and I sort of felt the need to say to him, like, you're not a bad person if you don't keep this dog. Absolutely. And I think one of those is just a lot to unpack there from like beginning to end in terms of like the reasons we may have to rehome our dogs. So I think you and I probably see different reasons for why that happens. Um, yeah. My experience probably more on the illness side, more on the behavioral side. You probably see more behavioral side things, but yeah. like that's a big option that we or big issue we can talk about. There's also the how to find a reliable source if you are going to look to rescue a dog in the first place. Like mm -hmm. there is like we have to understand the motives from people trying to find these pets new homes. Um, and at the end of the spectrum is then yeah, when you have to make that difficult decision, how do you do it? What's the right reasons? Is it the right reason? And can I go into all those like conversations you've obviously clearly had with that owner? So I think there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack on each of those type of things. I think maybe a good place to start is just yeah, the reasons. I guess like I said, I see it more from the emergency side of things. Like even I, most of the dogs have come through like my practices because they can't afford care. They need to relinquish them. Mm -hmm. So they need to find a new home for them. So like that's the reason of giving one of them up. That's tough because it's a financial reason they're giving them up. Yeah. Um, and I've actually taken one of those dogs. Unfortunately, it's too sick at some point. We had to put it to sleep, but it's not easy. Like that's a really hard decision to make. It just for that's the one reason you have to relinquish a pet it's because you can't afford to. Um, but then you probably see more from the behavioral side. How often would you say you think you have these behavioral conversations? You know, I have behavioral conversations every day. Um, I think this is the only time. Maybe I can think of one other time where I actually was like, you, you need to rehome this dog. Like you need to find another home mm -hmm. for this dog. Now I have had people come to me, um, asking about euthanizing dogs that I thought probably, and I'm, I'm wary about talking people out of euthanasia, but, but it yeah. almost only when they border on like a convenience euthanasia. So one where this dog's not sick, um, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason they're, they're wanting to euthanize them either because they can't afford treatment for a condition or yeah and, and sometimes it's like a very treatable condition you know what i mean yeah um that's not like terribly expensive it's just too much for them um mm -hmm. and then sometimes it's you know if it's ever because of like a child or like you know because like yeah. a child's gonna get bit or something like that then i'm mm -hmm. very quick to be like yes you do need to rehome this dog um or yes. if it's to protect one of the other dogs in the home. So I have had that actually a couple of times where, you know, they already had a dog, maybe an older dog. They brought in a younger dog and they're fighting and it's becoming unsafe for one of the other dogs. Um, yeah. Just like when people are like, oh, they they snapped at my child. Now I'm a zero tolerance for sna slap snapping at children. I'm done. Done. You know, that yeah. animal should not be in your house. They shouldn't even have access. Like you should never trust a dog 100% or a cat. 
that they aren't going to bite because they're animals. At the end of the day, we love them. They're part of our family, but they are animals. And if they're in pain, if they're stressed, you know, even the mm. best dog in the world could could bite. And mm. it doesn't mean that they, you know, are a bad dog. It just means that they were in a situation and that was their way to deal with it. Um, but we have to protect children and we have to protect humans. Yeah. And so that is our job as veterinarians to do that. So those cases, I will tell people, yeah, you should rehome this dog. And then I have given people advice on how to rehome a dog. Like, um, especially if it's like a purebred dog, those are, mm -hmm. you're almost always going to be able to find a, um, like rescue, like a breed specific rescue that will take a dog, even with a bite history, especially like yeah. a Frenchie or a boxer or something like that. Like those are two of the breeds where I've actually had that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and then sometimes it's just a family member will take them and that's, that's fine too. Like you'll still get to see them. You can protect kids from them or the other yeah. dog that was being beaten up. But, um, but I definitely have had that happen where, you know, people, um, you know, I had one puppy that lost an eye because their, their dog, they had a Doberman who was a really sweet Doberman, but they brought in this tiny little froofy, like, you know, poodly thing. And she was adorable, but he didn't like her and he bit her head and she propped toast her eye and she ended up losing her eye. And, yeah. um, they ended up having to rehome while well, they rehomed him, which I have opinions on that, but, um, yeah, so that, he had, they had that dog first, you know what I mean? Yeah, so that's kind of like, you know, it's pretty easy to rehome a puppy, but yes, yeah, especially anyway. a one-on-one that's like, it's got cute charm already. So like, yeah, but also more. too, it was like they, but in this case, they, they actually had like the trainer that had worked with that dog. So that dog had a relationship with that trainer knew him really well. It was a safe place where they could visit him and they were going to be able to keep contact with him. And so that's where they rehomed him to. And so I'm like, okay, that's like, you Better know, the most. Right. Exactly. Um, and so, um, but I advocate a hundred percent that they protected that little dog. Do you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so exactly. while I might not have in my, myself done it that way, like I would think would have kept the dog that I'd had for 10 years, but, um, that's my opinion on that. But, um, but again, like they did the right thing to protect that little dog. Um, and she's sweet. Little yeah. Dog. And, and I would agree with that. I think that's like, is, I think my biggest thing is like, these are hard. There's a tough decisions. Like no matter yeah. what, they're going to be a tough decision. And two, you have to put the work in a little bit, like, especially when it comes to like convenience euthanasia. Yes. I've had those people come in and say, Hey, like these ones are like, is this not working out? Uh, or I'm moving. Uh, yeah. like, is this not working? Uh, I want to euthanize them. Like, Someone will make this work somewhere as long as the dog's not completely aggressive all the time. Right. Um, you know, putting fear into both you and your kid, you know, stuff like that. That's different. But like, you got to put a little bit of work in. That's like my biggest requirement. As long as you're willing to put a little bit of work in, this is just something that trusted you. You feed it, you fed it every day. They love you. Like, give them a chance, give them the same respect to take care of them and find a good place for them, whether it's the new dog that you just brought in or an older one. Yeah. Well, and also, too, I will tell you how so many times a day and most people they, they want to make it work you know what I mean like mm -hmm. it's the overwhelming majority that are like is there a medication we can do is there a trainer I can call yeah. um and and I'd say like there's probably certain behaviors that tend to be the thing that that make them want to rehome more than others so yeah. I'd say things that like destroy someone's house um whether it's you know urinating in the house whether it's um um, chewing up the furniture, you know, scratching up doors, scratch, you know, eating walls, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, crazy things like that, like, um, or, or attacking other family members. I mean, those are, those are usually the reasons why people get to the point where they're thinking about, um, you know, finding homes. Thing. Yeah. And I, I think, and those are tough issues, obviously. And a lot of, like you said, a lot of them are manageable or fixable in terms of like the, or having the right environment. Like, hell, Loki, when I first rescued him, a dog cost me fifteen hundred dollars in damages in the first like three months because oh, he I ate remember. my PlayStation Three. He ate through four cages. He ate my carpet. He ate my stethoscope. That was a dick move. Yeah. Um, a lot of things that I was like, "You are almost not worth this." And I actually remember at the time, uh, I was dating someone who had like I was like, "Hey, I'm, I'm not sure how this is working out." And she's like, "You have to you got, you give the dog a chance. Like you have to stick with it." And because of that advice, I'm fortunate I have the best dog in the world now. Right. But you have to put the work in. And like, not that we all don't have doubts. Like that's saying, like, I had doubts at that time. Like, is this the right dog for me? You know, sometimes you just have to put in that work and give them a shot. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then find them a new home where someone else might be a little more experienced than you are. Because mm -hmm. dogs are not easy. They 
they have needs and when it all comes down to like when you're having these conversations i think this will be a good segue back into like who's giving you guys these dogs in the first place is like rescues their job is to find homes for these pets you will even notice when they say hey this dog is clearly like pit bulls for example it'll clearly say on their thing even if it looks like a pit bull acts like a pit bull it'll say labrador mix on their thing <laughs> yeah why is because if they sell as a pit bull they can't get rid of it as easily as they can a labrador mix that right. makes it easier for rentals and so forth so like the motives behind and they're not bad motives like i get it like they want to help these pets find good homes you will find better care with a family taking care of one dog than one person taking care of 30. so there's a good reason for it but at the same time it's just take everything with a grain of salt and do trial periods first. Like say, Hey, can we take the dog home? See how they get along with something like our other dog is an instant. Like they don't get along at well at all. Then that's a red flag. Yeah. Uh, they know Unless the dog's you have history, the though. time, the resources and the ability to, to, to see if you gave them time, like, you know, mm -hmm. some dogs don't get along at first. And, and I think you're right. Like just to say like this, this particular situation with this guy, like he had already done, training he had already like he had done like a ton of things and it was mm -hmm. like she was attacking people with no warning and it was like yeah. you know what i mean like that's that's a really really hard one like and that's it, a big dog too like a shepherd yeah. oh, it's yeah. probably at least 45 to 60 pounds and that's yeah. the case then it's it's a big dog to attack other people like if it's chihuahua fine like pick it off the ground not the right. big deal like yeah. but yeah. when you have a shepherd, shepherd doing it like that can cause more significant damage. Oh, it, it and so could it's cause deal. like fatal damage. I mean, and you know, I, yeah. I don't know that this dog would do that, but still, I mean, you don't know. And and the thing <laughs> is, I think your point is really important is like, where are these rescues? And, you know, can you meet them ahead of time? And, mm. you know, like take into account the fact that, yes, their goal is to find a home for all of these dogs. Now you'd think mm. really good rescues go out of their way to match dogs with, with owners that make sense. Um, mm -hmm. part of it's also doing your research on like a lot of times they're mixed breeds and stuff like that, but like you can usually get a sense of their personality, especially if they've had a foster mm -hmm. mother, like, or foster father, like talk to them because they know them really, really well. It's still not a perfect yeah. situation. The dog that we adopted before we got Gus that bit Charlotte in the face lived in a family with children, but none of them were as young as my children. And so while I thought, well, you know, this dog is getting along great with kids and then met my kids and was just docile and sweet and calm. It was in a sort of false environment. It was in a park, you know yeah. what I mean? It was not in a house with toys and you know what I mean? And things like that. And Chaos and screaming and all those things. Exactly, exactly. And so while, yes, he was a very sweet dog, he hadn't actually lived in a house with kids under five. Mm -hmm. And he was painful the day that he bit Charlotte in the face. I mean, he was. He had just had his last heartworm treatment. And I, he was probably irritable and didn't feel well. And she had had the experience of being able to go up and pet him without him having a problem. And he snapped at her, you know. Yeah. Um, and thank God he didn't do any major damage. But we couldn't keep him after that. And that was like, I remember feeling like an absolute failure. I was like, I'm a veterinarian. Like, I should know better. I should have, I should have seen this. I should, you know what I mean? And so I can only imagine how people feel when they're in that oh, yeah. situation. But, but that's why it's really important to go talk to your veterinarian, ha you know, say like, is this a situation that's salvageable or is this such a situation where maybe I need to rethink, you know, us as a fit. And I, I think your veterinarian can tell you like, you know, cause sometimes people are like, I just want meds. And it's like, meds can make things worse, not better. Yep. And if you're not willing, like you said, to put in the work or not even not willing, maybe you just don't have the time. Like maybe mm -hmm. you rescued a dog that was two because you didn't have time to potty train a puppy. And so you knew that about your schedule and you were like, well, I'll be able to, you know, hang with an older dog, but I don't think I'll be able to like put in the time that it takes to really train a puppy. Well, then you're really not going to be able to train the dog with major behavioral issues either because they take oh, yeah. a lot of time. Yes, they do. And I think I think you brought up a really good point earlier too in saying that like do your research, but like look at the type of dog you're looking at getting. Because like certain dogs have certain characteristics like huskies. They're idiots. They're fun. They're a lot of work, but they're chaos. Uh yeah. you know, golden achievers, happy, go lucky, great family dogs. Like choose a dog. Like I think what was it? Back when I was in Chicago, I remember having a 
85 year old woman walk in with her brand new husky that was four or five months old um and she's like oh i've never had one of these type of dogs before i'm like you got the wrong dog like this dog will be wonderful for a young couple that can handle its energy requirements like you're about to break a hip here lady like this is yeah. not a good idea for you no. so like knowing yourself like so you, you brought it you put it perfectly like something's gonna fit into your lifestyle is a really important part of this because if you don't you're setting yourself up and the dog for failure and yeah I know we're talking about dogs a little bit, but it does apply to cats too. Um, like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Not all cats the same. In... What was that? Oh, I was saying not all cats are the same, and they have different personalities that require work. Oh yeah, I just had a cat, a, a woman that came in, sweet woman, really sweet, and she brought me this th cat who's awesome. She found him outside. He he's a gorgeous cat, beautiful. He's about a twelve pound cat. He shouldn't really be twelve pounds, but that's okay. <laughs> Most cats shouldn't be, but, but, you know, okay, fine. And so we were talking about that a little bit. Um, but, but she literally was like wanting to talk about, about declining him. And again, not to get into that whole conversation, but it's like, you know, I mean, he's a cat, he's acting like a cat mm. and you haven't really done everything to make him not act like a cat. That's going to do what cats do, which is scratch. Mm. And he's 12 pounds now. So declawing him is like, I mean, I think totally wrong <laughs> even if they're yeah. not 12 pounds but at 12 pounds is just horrible and yeah. um and so you know but she was very willing to have a conversation about okay well so what are some stress like how do i fix this then you know what i mean like what do i do yeah. um so that so that he's not destructive so because she loves him you know she doesn't want to hurt him she doesn't want to <laughs> do anything bad um and so we did we like went through like i taught her how to cut his nails I told her about, you know, the caps and everything. So I was like, so if cutting his nails don't doesn't make a difference, then we can always cap them. That's fine. I was like, but also too, like what kind of rugs does he like? Like find those spots, get that type of rug, put it in the spots where he does it. And then slowly over time, move them to where you want them to be. Like you have to work with him. This is a behavior he's supposed to have. He's supposed to exhibit. Mm -hmm. So give him a way to do it that doesn't destroy your house. And, you know, she was really, really thankful and really, really, really willing to do that. But there are some people that are just, they get cats and they're just unwilling to, to pivot, change, or think about something in a different way. And they're just like, nope, just take off all their claws. And it's just like, I shouldn't have a cat then. Might yeah. Be. And I, I agree. Like there's, there's, I can't think of any off the top of my head that would be like, like why I'd be okay with declawing a cat honestly these days. And, but I think people forget that like, just because the word is like they're domesticated doesn't mean they don't have natural instincts that they have grown up with their entire life like that's in their genetic code essentially like yeah i mean i think it's amazing when you look at like the and this is a big you know broad picture approach but you look at like wildlife in general like those animals that really pop up an eggshell and they know exactly where to go like turtles they know exactly where to go to the beach like they just right. like they pop out the eggshell they go straight for the beach and they hope to make it it's just in their dna same with the animals that we live with like mm -hmm. yes they're domesticated but they still have these natural instincts that they have to do or, or inclined to do because that's what they've been brought up to do so training them out of that takes work and you're fighting literally thousands of years of genetic like development and so forth so i think people just need to remember that like yes they're domesticated but they're not perfect yeah well and i even had another cat owner and again super, truly dedicated like she's gonna do all these things but like she was like yeah i don't know i mean he he gained all this weight he just want he'd like choose on things all over the house and and he like you know she had all these things and i was like okay well Let's think about, you know, maybe we need to be feeding him not more calories, but just like more times during the day. And maybe we need to give him some cat grass and like some things to occupy himself, some hunter feeders. Like, let's really think about his environmental enrichment and look at it and say, these are all normal things he's doing. Cats yeah. eat eight to 10 times a day and they hunt and they stock their food and they play and they, yeah, they sleep a whole bunch too. But like, if we don't give them those outlets, yeah, they're, they're going to come eat your computer. Like, that's what that's what he did. He, like, came and ate the side of her computer. And she was like, I, I mean, she's like, I love him and I want, you know. And so and so we were just talking about it. And 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 she was perfectly willing to do all those things. But they people do need guidance sometimes to do it. And yeah. I think when you get a pet, when you rescue, even when you get a puppy, because you don't want to rehome them. I mean, yes, obviously the goal is that we're not going to have to rehome them. Um, mm -hmm. I think that in those cases where it has to happen, you shouldn't feel guilty, but you should seek guidance from a, an expert, I think, before you just willy-nilly rehome your dog, um, which I actually don't think people do very easily, I'm going to just say. like I actually. Oh, yeah, I, I say, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very small number of people that, like, one have to do it. Um, yeah. it's, it's, like, as a whole, I think, you, like you mentioned earlier, like, 
most people try and hang on to their pets. They try and do everything they can. They go through most of the processes. Um, some pets are just more difficult than others, but for the most part, I think a majority of owners are pretty good about it. Yeah. But I think when you sign on to getting a pet, just like to button that up, like you really should do your research, Yeah, pick an animal that fits into your life, puppy rescue, whatever it is. If you have kids, you've got to take that into account. If you yep. have an elderly parent that lives with you, you have to take that into account. Or if you are the elderly parent, you have to take that into account. Um, but like all together, you know, really doing your research ahead of time and then seeking the help of somebody who who can help help you. But, you know, you have to be willing to put in the work, put in the time. Because um, otherwise I think, you know, it, it is, it can be really, really heartbreaking. But there are good resources out there for rehoming. There, you know, yeah. I know veterinarians more often than not will be as helpful as they can. And, you know, even think about how many people end up with pets because of these sorts of situations that work in vet clinics. Cause we all really are there for one reason. We, we really want to support you. We love your pets. We love the animals or else we would not have dedicated our lives to doing this. Um, you're not a bad person. If you have to rehome a pet, um, you will feel guilty. It, It was, it's hard to do. Um, but if, if it's really, really unsafe for the pet, another pet in your house or a human in your house, it's okay to do. And, um, just, just don't be afraid to reach out to your veterinary team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's not easy, but I think, uh, take the right steps and you work at it and use the guidance of a veterinarian. You can do the best thing that's for you and your pet. Um, Mm -hmm. and sometimes that is rehoming them. Sometimes it's not, it's like, sometimes you are giving them a better future by doing that. So don't always think it's a bad thing. It's tough. But sometimes you are giving them a better lifestyle because you put them in a situation that they're going to excel in. And that's a good thing too. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if anybody ever has any questions and they want to contact us at podcast at myballto.com, they certainly can do that. And um, yeah, if you ever have any questions about rescue rehoming or whether or not a certain breed is good for you, hey, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, yep. And uh, otherwise, it's good to have you back, Dr. Robert. Good seeing you, Sam. Yeah, it was me. lots of fun. Hope everybody enjoyed this podcast and um, enjoyed the topic. And this has been the Pause It Podcast. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye, guys.